The riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense All the songs are b-sides and the cover art's a mess There's so much here to tear apart Listen to it for a week Now that we pass past Why I hate this album Podcast with Tim and Garrett Hello and welcome to another episode of Why I Hate This Album I am one of your hosts, Garrett Harvey Not with me as always, co-host extraordinaire Loki to my Thor, Timothy Richardson Don't worry folks, Tim is not gone far In fact, I can see him as I talk to you right now. Uh, but we are going to be Timless on the episode this week. Maybe we can see if we can get him to hop on the mic for just a moment, but he is fairly busy. Normally, this is the episode where we pick an album or a song, listen to it for the entire week, and then come back here and tell you why or if we in fact hate it. Unfortunately, folks, we are in the process of moving. As the world opens back up again, we too must get back out there. Although we've become very accustomed to living and working in the exact same place. So Tim is currently in the process of moving the entire studio slash apartment to a new studio slash apartment. And to be fair, by moving, I I do mean he is just screaming at our interns as they move us right now. But what that means is a small delay in the schedule, and you're going to have to deal with me for an entire episode. Instead of the usual fare, I'm going to tell you a few short stories that are strange, mysterious, and most of them involve death. Uh, But don't worry, Tim will be back next week. We'll be settled in our new location, hopefully. One that does not have a giant hole in the side of the house. I think we'll be doing No Effects, Heavy Petting Zoo. That's a ridiculous album, as I recall. It's been a few years. I think Tim's got a particular fondness for it. Before we dive into the task at hand, I want to remind everybody, you can reach out to us by emailing us at heypodmail at gmail.com, and we want to hear from you. Or you can follow us on Instagram at heypod, on Twitter at albumheypod. You can follow me, Garrett, at gharveytweets. Tim is on Instagram, but he won't let you follow him, so don't even bother. Uh, Rate, review, subscribe if you can. Whatever platform you're listening to us right now, it makes all the difference in the world. We don't have ads, so if you can help us out, quick five stars, get it out of the way. And then feel free to abuse us heavily in the review itself. That's fine, but it does us a huge favor. Okay, I think that's all of the shameless plugs. We'll be back with the usual format next week. But until then, I give you Strange Deaths and Other Mysteries of the Music Industry, Volume 2. Randy Rhodes was born on December 6, 1956 in Santa Monica, California, the youngest of three children. His father left the family at a young age, forcing his mother to raise the kids alone. Having earned a bachelor's degree in music from UCLA, she opened a music school in North Hollywood called Musonia. Randy took guitar lessons from a young age, and by his teens, he was actually outpacing his instructors. At 16, Rhodes and his friend Kelly Garney formed the band Little Women. Randy graduated high school early through a program that allowed him to condense his classes so that he could teach at his mother's school during the day and play gigs with his band at night. They added lead vocalist Kevin DeBrow and drummer Drew Forsyth, and the band soon changed its name to Quiet Riot. By 1976, the band had made a name for itself in the L.A. club scene and were signed to CBS Sony Records. Unable to expand their appeal beyond Los Angeles, their first two albums were actually only released in Japan. And to make matters worse, while recording that second album, tensions between DeBrow and Garney came to a head after Garney drunkenly fired a handgun through the ceiling and then got into a fistfight with Rhodes. Following the incident, Rhodes had to sit and listen as Garney hatched a plan to shoot and kill DeBrow during the next session. This, of course, forced Rhodes to fire his longtime friend and band co-founder. In 1979, Black Sabbath was in the process of kicking out a very drunk and drug-addled Ozzy Osbourne, and there was a rumor he was starting a new band. But when Randy came to the audition, he didn't even meet Ozzy. He was so drunk that he just stayed in the studio control room the whole time and didn't say a word. Randy set up, played a few riffs, and then an engineer popped out of the booth and told him that he had the job. It was in a subsequent audition the next day in a hotel room, where Rhodes would actually meet Ozzy and show him what he could do. Over the next several weeks, they added bassist Bob Daisley and drummer Lee Kerslake to form Blizzard of Oz, as they were known at the time. Once formed, the band went to work recording at Ridge Farm Studios. What was interesting was that Rhodes' style of playing and his enthusiasm and creativity was actually inspiring Ozzy for the first time in several years, and despite the fact that he was knee-deep in alcoholism and God knows how many drugs, he began writing new songs and feeling like his old self. On September 20th, 1980, they released their self-titled album. The album was a massive success, selling 5 million copies in the U.S. alone. Before leaving for their first tour, both Kerslake and Daisley were suddenly fired by Sharon Arden, the band's manager and future Ozzy Osbourne wife. For the U.S. tour, drummer Tommy Aldridge and bassist Rudy Sarzo, who had been Rhodes' bandmate in Quiet Riot, were hired. 
The band embarked on a tour to support the album before heading back into the studio for their follow-up. On November 7, 1981, the band now going by the much simpler Ozzy Osbourne released their second album, Diary of a Madman. While not quite as big of a hit as their debut, the album still sold 3 million copies in the U.S. alone. This is also around the time that Randy began to mention that he was trying to decide whether or not he wanted to stay in the band long term. As the tour progressed, Ozzy made that decision incredibly easy. See, by this point, Ozzy is such a mess that he's often refusing to perform while on tour. He would be so hungover from the night before that they would arrive at the next venue, he'd refuse to get off the bus, and then they'd have to cancel and send everybody home. Their only chance was to see if Sharon could somehow coax Ozzy off the bus, but if she was unsuccessful, nobody was going to get him to play. The last straw came when a Black Sabbath live concert album was planned and Ozzy wanted the band to play on it. Rhodes felt like they were established enough that being a simple backing band, or even probably worse, a cover band, would be a step back, and he didn't want to perform on it. Ozzy, of course, took this as a major insult and threw a giant fit like a child. Eventually, the band did agree to play on the album, but Randy made it clear that he would do that, meet his contractual obligations, which was one more album and the subsequent tour, and then leave the band to pursue a degree in classical guitar. You know, like rock stars do. But before any of that, they had to finish touring for Diary of a Madman. On March 19, 1982, the band was headed to a festival in Orlando called Rock Super Bowl 14. when they stopped at Flying Baron Estates in Leesburg, Florida to fix a malfunctioning air conditioning unit on the bus. On the property, owned by the Calhoun Brothers Tour Bus Company, there was an airstrip and several small helicopters and planes. Now, for some reason, the tour bus driver, who also had his private pilot's license, Andrew Acock, decided to just borrow a single-engine Beechcraft F-35 plane and take it on a joyride. On the first flight, Acock took keyboardist Don Airy and tour manager Jake Duncan with him. During the flight, Acock buzzed the bus in an attempt to wake up drummer Tommy Aldridge and show everybody how cool he was. The group then landed and took off a second time, this time with Rhodes and makeup artist Rachel Youngblood aboard. They buzzed the bus twice, but on the third pass, one of the plane's wings clipped the top of the tour bus, breaking the wing into two parts and sending the plane spiraling out of control. The plane then severed the top of a pine tree and crashed into the garage of a nearby mansion, bursting into flames. All three passengers were killed instantly and burned beyond recognition. According to Sharon Osborne, quote, They were all in bits. It was just body parts everywhere. Now, there wouldn't be any mystery to this story. It would just simply be a cautionary tale that I don't think anybody needed, but nonetheless, a story about how important it is to not screw around while flying a plane. But according to keyboardist Don Airy, the only person to actually witness the crash that day, quote, I had my camera, and I was taking photos of the plane to give to Randy afterwards. I had my telephoto lens on, and I could tell that there was some sort of struggle going on aboard the plane. The wings were rapidly tipping from side to side. End quote. You see, the bus driver slash pilot, Andrew Acock, was not in the best state of mind. He had spent the previous evening attempting to reconcile with his estranged wife, Wanda, taking frequent cocaine breaks to fuel the next round of arguing. According to witnesses, when Acock brought the plane around for the third pass, she was actually standing in the doorway of the bus, watching the approach. The theory goes, grief-stricken and gacked out on Ye, Acock may have intended on crashing the plane into the bus that day instead of clipping it and scaring everyone. It may very well be that Randy Rhodes saved five lives at the cost of his own. Following the death, Randy has been recognized countless times for his contributions to heavy metal, saving Ozzy Osbourne's career by his own admission, and helping to define the sound of heavy metal lead guitar for the next 20 years. Green Day was formed in the East Bay of California in 1987 by lead vocalist and guitarist Billy Joe Armstrong and bassist and backing vocalist Mike Dirt. Green Day was originally part of the late 80s, early 90s punk scene at 924 Gilman Street Club in Berkeley, California, a do-it-yourself non-profit venue for bands and artists. The band's early releases, 39 Smooth and Kerplunk, were with the independent record label Lookout Records, and while not massive hits on their release, they did help to build word of mouth for the band and get a major label release. In 1994, their third album and major label debut, Dookie, released through Reprise Records, became a breakout success selling over 10 million copies in the U.S. alone. Their next two albums, Insomniac and Nimrod, were also successful, but only managed to capture a quarter of the sales of Dookie. In 2000, Green Day released their sixth album, Warning. Rather than quieting the critics and justifying their earlier success, it was, at the time, their worst performing record and a major disappointment for the label. Grateful for another chance, the band was eager to get back in the studio and prove their worth. The next album, Cigarettes and Valentines, quickly began to take shape as a return to the band's roots, fast-paced punk, reminiscent of Dookie. However, despite the album being almost complete, 
in 2003, all of the masters mysteriously disappeared from the studio. According to the band, all the demos for the album were stolen, and despite backups being made, the band felt that it just wasn't going to be the same. Rather than re-record the record, Green Day started over, and the result was American Idiot, their most successful album. Now, in a 2016 interview with frontman Billy Joe Armstrong and bassist Mike Durnt, the pair confirmed that they had actually since recovered the tapes, and that they were planning to use segments from the tracks as part of follow-up songs they were currently working on, rather than release the originally planned album end-to-end. What remains a mystery, if you want to call it that, just exactly how they reacquired the tapes in question, I'm going to guess Green Day, realizing they had yet another terrible album on their hands, scrapped the entire thing, put it in Billy Joe's trunk, and buried it in the desert like those terrible E.T. video games. Maybe someday Billy Joe will let us know, but I suspect this is a secret he will take to his grave. Iron Butterfly was formed in San Diego in 1966. The band moved to Los Angeles and was signed to Atco Records, an Atlantic subsidiary. Even before their first album, Heavy, could be released, the band was plagued with lineup changes. They quickly backfilled their departing bandmates and began to tour. It wasn't until their sophomore album, In Agata De Vida, that the band found real success. The record had sold 3 million copies in the U.S. by the end of 1970, and would go on to sell 30 million copies worldwide. Just soak that in. 30 million. The band recorded two more albums together through continued lineup changes to diminishing returns, and on May 23, 1971, they played their final show at Central Oregon Community College in Bend, Oregon. That was until 1974, when a promoter convinced former band members Eric Brand and Ron Bushy to create a new Iron Butterfly. They signed to MCA Records and added bassist Philip Taylor Kramer and keyboardist Howard Reitz to the lineup. The new Iron Butterfly put out two albums, Scorching Beauty and Sun and Steel, in 1975. Both were critically panned and earned significantly less money than their earlier albums had. The lineup broke up and Kramer continued to play with founding member Ron Bushy in groups like Magic and Gold between 1977 and 1980. When that ended, Philip Taylor Kramer went on to obtain a degree in aerospace engineering. The son of a professor of electrical engineering, he had a lifelong interest in science and math. In fact, in 1964, at the age of 12, Philip had won the science fair at Liberty School in Youngstown, Ohio, by building a laser with a beam so strong it was capable of popping a balloon. Now, you gotta remember, in 1964, people were not walking around with lasers, so this was a bit of a big deal. After graduating, he worked on the MX Missile Guidance System for the U.S. Department of Defense, and later in the computer industry on fractal compression, facial recognition systems, and advanced communications. In 1990, at the age of 38, Kramer co-founded Total Multimedia Inc. with Randy Jackson, brother of Michael Jackson, to develop data compression techniques for CD-ROMs, and a second company called Soft Video. Unfortunately, by 1994, both companies were reorganized under bankruptcy, and Kramer was under a tremendous amount of stress. He began saying very strange things like, quote, God's a scientist, a perfect scientist, chaos is perfect order. And even stranger things like, you've got to be centered. If you're centered, you'll be saved when the supernova happens and they come. Disturbing statements to hear from your brother and husband, to say the least. He was becoming deep into mysticism and began seeing sacred objects in everyday life where everyone else saw a trash can or a tree. Then on February 12, 1995, Kramer went to go pick up a business associate and investor by the name of Greg Martini and Martini's wife at Los Angeles International Airport. He arrived early, waited about 45 minutes, and then left before his passengers had even landed. After this, he made a flurry of 17 phone calls to various people including his wife, business associates, and the former Iron Butterfly drummer and good friend Ron Bushy, who said he sounded stressed and scared and maybe like he had been crying. He also told Martini, the man he had gone to the airport to pick up and then left before he ever landed, over the phone that something had come up and that he and his wife should go directly to the hotel where he and his wife would meet them later. And he, quote, had a big surprise for her. The last call he made was to 911, during which he said he was going to kill himself, giving the cryptic message, quote, I'm going to kill myself and I want everyone to know O.J. Simpson is innocent. They did it, end quote. After this, he disappeared. He never arrived at the hotel, his cell phone was off, and his credit cards were never used again. Circumstantial evidence would point to a man who had broken under the stress of his job and might have just wandered off, or potentially ended his own life. 
But the comments he made before disappearing aren't quite as crazy as they seem. It turns out, Kramer was doing a little bit of work for the FBI and the DEA on video compression. His most recent contract actually did involve video from the O.J. Simpson case. Then, two weeks after Kramer's disappearance, his wife received a call in which he simply said, hello, hello, and hung up. It would be the last time anyone would ever hear Philip Taylor Kramer speak. For years, there were fan sightings and reports of Kramer around the world, but finally on May 29th, 1999, at least part of the mystery was solved. Kramer's car and body were found at the bottom of Decker Canyon near Malibu, California. The remains were highly desiccated, but dental records did confirm it, and the cause of death was seen to be merely the blunt force of trauma from the drop into the canyon. Authorities came to the conclusion that for all of the theories, the final cause of death was, quote, probable suicide due to Kramer's financial problems. Yet many are not convinced. One of those people happens to be his father, Ray Kramer, who claimed that his son had specifically told him that if he ever turned up dead and it was ruled as a suicide, that he was not to believe it. Ray thinks that his son was targeted by people who knew he was on to groundbreaking research, including the secret to faster than light travel and communications. It is an area that he himself claims to be, quote, involved in, and according to him, his son had finally cracked it. Now, personally, these statements from his father make me think this is almost certainly an accidental suicide, and not that the former bass player of Iron Butterfly was secretly a modern-day Albert Einstein and was silenced by the government because he had created a way to travel faster than the speed of light. It's all very strange, it's certainly interesting, and will probably never be solved. In 1965, at Virtue Sound Studio in Philadelphia, a strange song called The Peanut Duck was recorded. It was a novelty song styled after Chubby Checker's Twist or Little Eva's Locomotion, the kind of song that teaches you how to do the dance in the song itself. After recording the song, the acetate was put in a box with no label and no attempt was ever made to release it. The record then sat in that box unheard until a British DJ purchased it in the mid-80s. He released the song as a single with the artist listed as a woman named Marcia Gee, an actual person who had a single out in 1965 with Uptown Records, but it certainly wasn't Peanut Duck. The song was later re-released, officially by Rhino Records in 2005, still attributing the song to Marcia Gee. In the 55 years since its recording and subsequent releases, no one associated with the song has ever come forward. Not the singer, the writer, the engineer, nobody. But that might not be the biggest mystery in the world. The biggest mystery about this story is what does it all mean? The song itself has bothered me for years. I heard it in the early aughts, and from time to time it resurfaces on the internet, and I've never been able to learn anything about it, and the song itself makes almost no sense, but I find it weirdly hypnotic. Allow me to read some lyrics. There's a brand new dance that's sweeping the nation. The peanut duck is the new sensation. Now, up to this point, we have what you would expect from a novelty song. Then the song continues. Now listen close. I'm going to tell you all how to do the peanut duck. Flap your arms like a duck. High and low. Move your neck like a duck. Fast or slow. You can really do it. So let's get to it. Now, there's nothing on the surface that's wrong with the description of this dance other than the fact that if you picture it in your mind, it sounds insane. I would love to see a room full of people doing the peanut duck. Listeners, write in, send us video, hatepodmail at gmail.com or album hatepod on Twitter, hatepod on Instagram. Show us your videos doing the peanut duck. And that brings us to my favorite part of the song. After they explain what it is and how to do it, kind of, then the rest of the song is pretty much a breakdown into a series of quacks and scatting, or as I call it, squacking. There's not much to the song, but it's also fascinating to think that in 1965, a song could be created and not a single person involved in its creation has ever admitted what it is or where it came from. Now, that could just be that nobody wanted to claim to have invented this ridiculous mess. But I do want to say, if you're having a bad day and you're looking to bring a smile to your face, give Peanut Duck a listen. And I dare you, just try not to quack along. Brian Jones was born February 28th, 1942, in Cheltenham, about 100 miles outside London. An attack of croup at the age of four left Jones with severe asthma that would plague him for the rest of his life. He listened to classical music as a child, but preferred blues, particularly Elmore James and Robert Johnson. At the age of 15, he heard the music of Cannonball Adderley and added jazz to his obsessions. 
That same year, his parents got him a saxophone, and he spent the following two years immersing himself in music. Then in 1959, at the age of 17, Brian received two more surprises, an acoustic guitar from his parents and an unexpected pregnancy from his teen girlfriend, Valerie. Despite Brian's protests, she kept the child and put him up for adoption. Brian dropped out of school and became a vagrant traveling across Europe before finally returning back to London. By 1961, Brian had fathered two more children, the first with a married woman who chose to raise the baby with her then-husband and without Brian, and the second with his girlfriend at the time, Pat Andrews. It's worth noting that Brian would then go on to father two more children for a total of five children with five different women and behave as a father to roughly none of them for any appreciable amount of time. Brian Jones, kind of an asshole. Now in London, Brian made ends meet with odd jobs, filling in with jazz bands and his own new band, The Roosters. It was also during this time, while playing at the Ealing Jazz Club, that Brian first met Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. Eventually, Brian left the group, and in May of 1962, he placed an ad in Jazz News, a local publication at the time, inviting musicians to audition for a new R&B group at the Bricklayers Arms Pub. Pianist Ian Stewart was the first to respond. Then Mick Jagger joined. After bringing his flatmate Keith Richards to a few rehearsals, Keith joined the band, and the Rolling Stones were formed. There was some initial lineup shuffling over the next year, but by 1963, they added Bill Wyman on bass, allegedly because he had a spare guitar amp and a constant supply of cigarettes, and the jazz-influenced Charlie Watts on drums, who was widely considered at the time to be one of the best drummers in London. That same year, Decca, having passed on the Beatles, signed the Rolling Stones with a royalty rate three times the normal size just to make sure that they didn't lose out again. And on April 16, 1964, Decca released their debut self-titled album, The Rolling Stones. The American version had a slightly different track list and came out on London Records in 1964, subtitled England's Newest Hitmakers, which would actually later become the official terrible title of that album. This is a very strange album if you've never heard it. It's almost entirely covers that fail to make any sort of impression outside of the UK. It wasn't until their second real studio album, and no, I'm not counting 12 by 5. If you don't know what that is, you're fine. And if you do, good for you. But their second real studio album, The Rolling Stones No. 2, was released January 1965, and it was a true hit. The album hit number one on the charts with the UK and its corresponding US version that was released in February as The Rolling Stones Now. Why they gave them such ridiculous names, I'll never know. July of the same year saw the release of Out of Our Heads, and their fame continued to grow. As I'm listing these off, notice the dates and how quickly they began to release albums from 1964 until 1969. It's amazing. The band's next album, Aftermath, released in the spring of 1966, was significant for a few reasons. The first was up until now, Jagger and Richards had only been slowly writing their own songs and filling in the album with covers. But Aftermath was all Jagger and Richards' originals. This was also the album where Brian got to show his talents as a multi-instrumentalist. For Paint It Black, he added sitar. For Lady Jane, he added dulcimer and, to under my thumb, marimbas. As Brian got the chance to expand his musical contribution, his prominence and control over the band itself was starting to fade. Brian wanted to push the band in more of a jazz direction and was struggling to keep up with what was becoming a very prolific songwriting pair in his own band. This loss of control began to exacerbate a distance that had existed between Brian and the rest of the band since its beginning. Brian had always taken more credit than he probably deserved, and at times even more money, claiming he had earned it for getting the band the gigs, and acting as their de facto manager. Aftermath was a hit, and was bolstered by a very successful North American tour. In January of 1967, the band released Between the Buttons, and while the album was another chart topper, the band began to be hounded by authorities for their drug use. On February 12th, Sussex police raided a party at Keith Richards' home. No arrests were made at the time, but Jagger, Richards, and their friend-slash-art dealer, Robert Fraser, was subsequently charged with drug offenses. While they awaited their fate, Jagger, Richards, and Jones took a short trip to Monaco, accompanied by Marianne Faithful, Brian's girlfriend of two years, Anita Pallenberg, and some other friends. During this trip, Jones and Pallenberg had a falling out which is really a nice way of saying Jones that behaved like a nightmare had to be admitted to a hospital due to a number of ailments, both self-inflicted and then the result of being inebriated. And so Pallenberg left Jones at the hospital and left Morocco with Keith Richards. The two would then go on to stay together for another 12 years. Think about that. Your girlfriend of two years leaves you for your bandmate, who you then have to go on tour with, 
while he brings his girlfriend. Needless to say, it continued to widen the rift between Brian and Keith. After returning to London, on May 10th, 1967, Brian's home was raided and he was arrested for drug possession when police found marijuana, cocaine, and methamphetamine in his flat. For some reason, Brian admitted to the pot, but then denied that he uses any hard drugs, which was laughable to anyone who knew him and to anybody who had been in this house. In December of 1967, the Stones released their Satanic Majesty's Request. The album jumped to the top of the charts, but sales quickly dropped as more people heard it. A departure from their blues roots, the concept album was viewed as a pretentious reaction to the Beatles' Sgt. Peppers. Honestly, I think we should do this album on the show. It's interesting and weird, and not everybody knows it, but we'll see if Tim wants to. Anyway, Brian was arrested then for a second time on May 21st, 1968 for possession of cannabis, which he claimed had been left there by the previous tenants of the flat, which is just about a half a step above, no, no, I'm just holding it for a friend. This was particularly worrisome because he was on probation at the time, and if found guilty, he faced a fairly lengthy jail sentence. He was in fact found guilty, but the judge decided he was kind of an okay dude, so he merely fined him 50 pounds, or the equivalent of about 880 pounds today, plus an additional 105 pounds, or about 1,800 pounds in today money, for court costs. As the band focused on their next album, Brian's drug use continued to worsen, and he became moody and unreliable. He would show up to the studio occasionally and demand to play things that he wanted to play, despite what the band had been working on or was in the process of trying to complete. Needless to say, his behavior created an even bigger rift between him and his bandmates. Despite the issues, Beggar's Banquet did manage to get released in December of 1968, and Brian played an integral role on every song but two. When you listen to the album, you can tell that Brian was easily bored and didn't want to play the same type of instrument or style for any amount of time. He plays sitar and tanpura on Street Fighting Man, slide guitar on No Expectations, acoustic guitar and harmonica on Parachute Woman, and Mellotron on Jigsaw Puzzle and Stray Cat Blues, just to name a few. Hot on the heels of Beggars, the group began working on the follow-up album Let It Bleed. The plan was to release Let It Bleed in July and go out on tour in North America in November, but there were of course problems. Brian was now completely consumed with addiction, and his depression had gotten to the point that he would show up to the studio but contribute almost nothing. What he did do was drive the band's Jaguar to go shopping one day and then leave it parked in the middle of the street for it to eventually be towed. He also drove a motorcycle into a shop's front window and was injured so badly that he had to be admitted into hospital under an alias. Worse than all of this, though, was that Stone's management informed them that because of Brian's second arrest and conviction, it would be completely impossible for him to get a work visa and therefore allow him to tour the United States with the Stones. At the suggestion of Ian Stewart, the band brought on guitarist Mick Taylor, and on June 8, 1969, Jones was visited by Jagger, Richards, and Watts, who told him he was out of the group. Publicly, they allowed Brian to make it seem as though it was his decision, stating, quote, I no longer see eye to eye with the others over the discs we are cutting. While this is a slight oversimplification of things, it probably wasn't entirely untrue either. Brian had stated several times he was not pleased with the direction of the band. At this time, Brian was living at Crotchford Farm in East Sussex, the former residence of Winnie the Pooh creator A.A. A. Milne, with several questionable people on a non-stop bender. At midnight on July 3rd, 1969, less than a month after being kicked out of the Rolling Stones, Brian Jones was found dead at the bottom of his swimming pool with his inhaler sitting on the edge. In attendance on the night of his death was girlfriend Anna Wallen, friend and nurse Janet Lawson, who actually found Jones's body, and builder-slash-carpenter Frank Thorogood. According to Lawson, Frank and Brian had decided to go on a night swim after drinking and taking some pills, and the next time she saw either of them, Brian was sitting at the bottom of the pool. Coroner Angus Somerville ruled Jones's death was the result of, quote, drowning by immersion in fresh water associated with severe liver dysfunction caused by fatty degeneration and ingestion of alcohol and drugs. An autopsy revealed Jones's liver was also twice the normal weight. Given his history and the circumstances, it wasn't hard to believe that Brian, already in poor health and inebriated, drowned alone in his pool. The investigation was quickly conducted and ruled, quote, death by misadventure, which basically means it was an accident. However, there are some other details that have led people to question that narrative. The pathology report found pep pills, sleeping pills, and alcohol in his bloodstream, though none in quantities that would point to an overdose or even a blackout allowing him to drown. 
Also, Brian and his night swim buddy, Frank, weren't getting along at this time. Frank had been paid about 18,000 pounds, or 256,000 pounds in today money, for work he had done out at Crotchford Farms, but felt he was owed another 6,000 or 85,000 in today money. The two had gotten into a heated screaming match before Brian fired Frank, but then invited him to stay, hang out, and, you know, do some pills and go for night swims. By most accounts, Frank had been leeching off of Brian, and he was finally being cut off. Which points to the most obvious theory, that Frank was angry that night, they got a little drunk, went for a quote, night swim, and Jones got drowned. Curiously, the police didn't really pursue this motive beyond initial interviews with Frank. There's also a theory that longtime Stone's chauffeur, and I'm using that very loosely, Tom Keylock, may have had something to do with his death. Several friends and neighbors reported seeing Keylock taking a number of items out of the house shortly after the death and burning large piles of something on the property. Over the years, there's been several books posing alternative theories, with Keylock even claiming in 1994 that Thorogood had confessed to him on his deathbed that he killed Jones that night. But then in 2009, a former Stones Road manager accused Keylock of being the killer and of silencing witnesses through intimidation. None of these claims are corroborated or substantiated, but there is one theory that can at least be partially confirmed by the people that were there that night. Witness testimony and later interviews claim that Jones and Thorogood were seen playing in the pool together, wrestling, dunking each other, and then they were left alone while everybody else went out to do presumably more drugs. The theory is that Brian drowned accidentally while screwing around in the pool, or the slightly more sinister had an asthma attack or couldn't make it to the edge for any number of reasons, and Frank just sort of failed to assist him once he began struggling. Years later, Lawson did claim to have seen Thorogood shortly before finding the body. According to her, he was unresponsive, shaking uncontrollably, and soaking wet, as though something had just happened somewhere near the pool. Despite all of this, Thorogood was never seriously pursued as a suspect, and Keylock was never even interviewed by detectives. Brian Jones' official cause of death remained death by misadventure, a less specific but no less accurate description of how he died. Brian Jones was not only a founding member of the Rolling Stones, but he was the leader of the band in the early years when nobody wanted to be the adult. A multi-instrumentalist, he drove the band to be different and helped to forge a sound that could be heard over the Beatles. After his death, the band released Let It Bleed, but having been kicked out halfway through the recording, Brian's final contribution to a Rolling Stones album was just simply him being featured on two songs playing backup. The Stones themselves have of course gone on to sell roughly 240 million albums, win multiple awards, and become one of the most iconic rock bands of all time. But it is difficult to believe that any of this could have happened or would have happened without the early talents and drive of Brian Jones. Okay, guys, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Five fun stories, some of them long, some of them short, some of them I'm sure you knew. Uh, who knew about the peanut duck? That thing has been haunting me for years. If you know anything about the peanut duck, contact us. And if you've never heard it, get to Googling immediately. Uh, as always, we want to hear from you. You can email us directly, as I've said, at hatepodmail at gmail.com, or you can go to hatepod.com. That has every episode we've ever done, just about. You know, it takes a while to update, so leave me alone. Uh, but you can still get our podcast everywhere you find your podcast. If you've got a source that I'm not supplying this podcast to, reach out, let me know, and I will get that updated ASAP. You can also find us on Twitter, we're Album Hate Pod, or on Instagram, we're Hate Pod. And God, we want to hear from you. Let's get those followers up. We're a small podcast, but we we work awful hard and we appreciate you guys reaching out to us. So if you can, let us know what you like, what you don't like. Suggestions for the show, they get added to the list and we do make our way through it. But also just email us with your weird stories. Uh, maybe you've got some corrections here. Guys, I'm just one man, so I'm sure I didn't get all the details right. Uh, I also had to put this together on pretty short notice, so I left some core details out, I'm sure. Feel free to hit me with corrections and updates, but if you can, be nice about it. And of course, we always want to hear suggestions for our regularly scheduled episodes i think that's about it uh tim will be back next week for no effects uh heavy petting zoo until then for why i hate this album i have been one of your hosts garrett harvey there's cowboys running through my dreams nothing's quite the way it seems I joined the Navy 
got kicked out in a week My facial features aren't distinct Try to find some meaning in these songs The genius is a genius, got it wrong No, it's a lobster murder sex thing It's the bleaching of the rear A full assault on both your ears The riffs are too repetitive The lyrics make no sense All the songs are besides The cover art's a mess Listen to it for a week Now that week has passed It's the Why I Hate This Album Podcast With Tim and Gary